All right, bam. There we go. We did it. We're live. Technological problems have been overcome. Right. We've slowly started to uh, figure out how to fix the Texas football program. <laughs> and now we can go live and maybe talk about some some training stuff for people. Patrick, thank you so much. Are you? Oh, I didn't even ask. Do you go by Pat or Patrick? Doesn't doesn't matter, Pat or Patrick. You think, thanks for having me on, man. It's it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So Pat Estes, right? Yep. Um, for the people listening or watching that have never heard of you, maybe don't know who you are, what you do, can you give them the quick the quick rundown just so we're all on the same page? Yeah, I was a uh, collegiate strength coach for a long time. Uh, had the pleasure of being under some phenomenal coaches. I got to actually, we were talking a little North Carolina history. Uh, actually went to Lenore Ryan and did football and men's basketball, Lenore Ryan as a strength coach. Then was at University of Texas uh, under Todd Wright and Logan Schwartz, two amazing coaches, mentors of mine still. And they introduced me to Gary Gray, Dave Tiberio. I did the, did the whole gift program, and that was a phenomenal. Uh, really pushed me in a different direction and thought process. And, you know, it just comes down to understanding what we're learning in school might not exactly be what is, <laughs> what is, what is real um, and, and scientific truth. And then we're, we're actually seeing that occur. I'm, I'm watching that happen again, going into some of this bioenergetic stuff that we were talking about. But uh, I let, left Texas and went to the University of Denver, got to work with Matt Shaw, um, you know, got to work with Bill Tierney, probably one of the best coaches of all time and with the men's lacrosse team. Uh, then I was at University of Maryland. Got to give a shout out to my boy Kyle Tarp there. Uh, and, you know, basically just learned from all those guys and then started kind of taking bits and pieces from other coaches like Dan Pat. Uh, and then learned did a lot of manual therapy stuff with Lenny Parasino. And at that time I was pretty uh, function based, and then spent a couple years diving down the kind of the PRI rabbit hole, uh, and then came out of came out of that towards the end of my Denver stint and Maryland stint, and then kind of had enough of the collegiate setting and wanted to just be able to deliver a more encompassing product to to my athletes and clients, and that's when me and Aaron kind of started what is now called Evolve Health and Performance. He likes to change the name on people for him, train adapt evolve. And now we're also working with Brian Kozak. So Aaron and Brian have kind of, you know, taught me, you know, more about bioenergetics than almost anybody else. I was definitely in the camp of I was the strength coach that had read Joel Jameson's book and then was like, I'm good to go. I know what conditioning is. I'm I don't need to worry about anything else because I was definitely asleep during exercise fizz, you know, <laughs> like was, 99 percent of undergrads. Yeah, I was I was definitely asleep. I was like, I'm trying to get a C in this class and then get to practice and, you know, get, yeah. get out of here. Um, I'm trying to get strong and, and lift weights like I'm not, I'm not worried about uh, cellular processes. But and and now I am. So here, here you go. There we are. Right. It's. It's funny when you talk to people that go through the exercise fizz programs and then they usually get a handful of years into coaching and they're like, you know, I probably should have paid more attention to my physiology classes, right? Because like people that get into this, like we get into it because we like to train. It's like we're athletes. I'm going to throw down in the weight room. Like how dare you try to talk to me about glycogen and mitochondria and all this other stuff. That shit doesn't matter. Blah, 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 blah. Right. And then... And then you eventually reach your ceiling and it's like, well, I can't really improve as a coach from like a programming conceptual standpoint unless my physiology gets better because I just don't know what's going on underneath the hood. Yeah. And if you, if you don't understand that and, and the, the crazy thing is I almost feel like I got lucky in, from the standpoint of meeting Aaron when we did and getting exposed to Nears so early on because I didn't know what was going on before. And then it allowed me just to learn kind of more what we would deem like the truth, the new kind of physiology model. And I got to start a little fresh. So I got to pay attention and I was like, well, these guys are a lot smarter than me. So I'm going to listen to what they have to say. And 
this technology has given us all this information. So I, I kind of, I kind of snuck out there, but it's definitely a, it's a, it comes down to an ego thing. You know, if you want to learn what's really going on, you have to put aside like, you know, Hey, I won a national championship doing stuff that probably wasn't the most optimal for my athletes, but that doesn't mean that I still don't want to move forward and grow and continue to deliver a better product. Yeah. Without question. So, uh, a cool place to start this conversation could be in that structure function bioenergetics realm. If you want to think about potentially a couple of light bulb moments or bigger variables for you when you dove into that. Yeah. Are uh, there any that jump off the page is like this totally changed how I thought about things? I mean, I think each. So if you, if we, that's kind of our like philosophy at Evolve is this structure function bioenergetics and and each one took like years to create that bucket so i spent you know from the time that i was a young strength coach all the way through being under todd and doing gift fellowship and everything like that i only had the function bucket you know like understanding chain reaction biomechanics and and 3d movement and so i only had this function bucket and i i rolled with that and then even when you talk to other people Oh, the, the, these other things, you don't need to worry about them. You know, they're, they're extremely dogmatic. And it w- wasn't until I got exposed to some PRI stuff that I was like, wow, that's completely opposite end of the spectrum. And that's kind of like this structure bucket where, you know, joint ranges of motion matter, you know, understanding postural patterns um, and position matters. And it was this light bulb moment where I was like, oh, wow, like, if I have to give you an example, like if I have a pelvis that's already in an internally rotated position, I might see a lack of hip internal rotation, the motion. And that was kind of like, oh shit, now I have these two things and I have to learn how to balance them. And then in the past, I would say probably like five years, it's been, oh, wait a second. There's this other bucket, this bioenergetic bucket that really influences all all three they each influence each other and and then once you kind of start like spinning that wheel around uh it takes you down a rabbit hole and from every standpoint you could think of you know whether it be rehab nutrition strength and conditioning um it doesn't matter it's we're, we're just talking about fundamental truths of the human body now and then how you express them in your programming or your training um but you know, if we, if we want to kind of give you an example, if we want to like dive down in, in that structure bucket, like I said, like anybody with a PRI background is well more versed in it than I am. But we, we if we're taking a, let's say somebody has an inversion ankle sprain, like super common. We see it all the time. Uh, how does it normally get treated in like most athletic training rooms? Uh, we're going to put a boot on it from, you know, depending on the grade. And then we're going to give the athlete some crutches and then we're going to give it time to heal and we might do some e-stem and some ice and then let them maybe walk without the boot a little bit. Uh, but when you start, when you start diving into these buckets, you kind of see like all the different variables that can go into kind of that return to play process. So if I'm thinking structure bucket with an inversion ankle sprain, I want to look at that athlete's structural foot position. All right, do they have an inverted rear foot, which would kind of predispose them already to getting the inversion inversion ankle sprain do they have a where, where's their sacral position at do they have a functional leg length due to sacral rotation if they have a short right leg and a inversion ankle sprain and a inverted rear foot now you really have a situation that's set up for the athlete to continue to have this injury and then when you take the boot off you're going to continually be putting stress back where the injury occurred. So it's like, okay, so now if we're thinking from the structure side treatment process, well, I have to treat this sacral position because I know that the body always wants to keep your eyes level and the feet on the ground. And so if, if I have this right leg that's functionally short, it is going to, in during swing phase, it's going to invert itself even further than it already is to try to get it level and get it on the ground faster. So 
if I want this athlete and this tissue to be able to heal and take stress off of it, I have to treat the sacral position, right? And then I have to have appreciation for the rear foot position. And now that, I mean, with that understanding of biomechanics, that takes you right into the function bucket, right? So, okay, well, now if, if I fix this leg length and I have appreciation for the rear foot position, I know that one calcaneal and subtalar joint eversion are incredibly important to me. And because there is an injury there and that tissue is going through inflammation and going through healing, the body is going to take away two different things. It's going to take away motion. And more importantly, it's going to take away ankle dorsiflexion and eversion. Obviously, inversion, the third motion, there's a ton of pain there due to the injury. So it's going to kind of take away motion, but I can drive eversion and dorsiflexion most of the time pain-free, especially if you preposition that inverted rear foot, right? If you preposition it in eversion, you'll get this motion there. And, you know, motion is lotion. So the more that I can drive the, this dorsiflexion and eversion in this ankle sprain, when I, going back to coming out of this boot, you know, instead of me having an ankle that is limited in all three motions, now I have an ankle that is already restored eversion, restored dorsiflexion. And the last thing you want coming out of that situation as of the ankle sprain is that you have an ankle that is now limited in all three, and it's going to affect the tibial internal rotation of the front leg and gait, which is going to affect the, the femoral uh, the femoral internal rotation, which is going to affect the hip. And now because you, you took this athlete and you put him in a boot and you didn't drive any motion from a three dimensional functional position. Now you, you're going to probably see dysfunction happen all the way up the chain when they're kind of returning to play. And those two buckets were like, man, I was, I was like honed in on those for a long time. And from an ankle sprain, it never really occurred to me like, Oh, well, if I had a better understanding of bioenergetics, how could I also help, you know, this injury and get my athlete back even faster? And once you start learning about, you know, breathing and oxygen and CO2, it becomes very apparent that if I could have my athlete go and drive a hypoxic position, I'm going to then create a vasodilation, which is going to bring uh, better fluid dynamics, which is going to bring more blood flow, which is going to speed up the healing. And then I can do that in conjunction with driving ankle dorsiflexion and eversion. Like then you're really putting all three things together and you have, you're going to have an athlete that's going to, I mean, I want to say like two weeks ago, we had an athlete roll their ankle and followed a similar protocol. And she goes to the doctor, Oh, okay. I'm going to be out you know, three to four weeks, she was back, she was back in like eight days, back running in eight days. And, and so it's, I never appreciated how me understanding cellular processes was going to make me better at rehab or better at training. And that's kind of where the, the triad really kind of flows. It, it goes even beyond what people normally come to us for, uh, from an education standpoint, like the webinar we just did is, is based around, you know, the new energy system model where we're basically telling people like, hey, that old, you know, this anaerobic process that happens early on, it's not really what's going on. You know, the aerobic system and the creatine phosphate system are, are linked together. Uh, they desaturate together. They recover together. You know, you know, you did all kinds of research in, in this area. You know more about it than I do. But it really just comes down to having appreciation. For I know that I want my athlete from a bioenergetic standpoint to use the process that is most efficient and gives me the most bang for my buck, which now that we know that the oxidation occurs immediately during exercise, and if, ox if we're using oxidation, we're getting 36 ATP to replenish that CP that we need to produce power and repeatability. And if oxidation is not present, then I'm using glycolysis, which is only giving me two, 
Like, ask any kid, do you want 36 cupcakes or do you want two cupcakes? <laughs> you know yeah, I mean? plus the added complication of pH changes. Yeah, like, I mean, you can go down a whole a whole rabbit hole there of all these different, the, this cascade of, of things that happen. But I think we, we, we can get as complicated as we want. But one of the things that I'm taking from bioenergetics is let's simplify it and just say, if we are in an oxidative state, we can have optimal performance and power. If we're not in an oxidative state, we're in a survival state. And what do we get in a survival state? We probably like, if I'm running from a lion, save my life. Is that the best time for me to learn how to juggle? I suck at juggle. You know what I mean? I probably need to be in a much different environment you know, within my physiology to be able to learn and have skill acquisition. But if I'm in a survival state and I'm running from a lion and you give me a a high motor learning task, it's probably not going to go well. Um, so I feel like I'm off on some kind of tangent. Do you want to rope me back in or? <laughs> no, this is beautiful. This is great. I love it. Yeah. Like people, it's funny. I tell guests when they get going, I'm like, it's fantastic for me because I have to ask less questions. Okay. <laughs> uh, but so a couple of things there, like a lot there that we could unpack. So one, I'll back up for the people listening. When we're talking about these different energetic pathways, different ways for us to regenerate ATP, right? The game is I need ATP so that it can then donate a phosphate to an empty creatine. And then I get creatine phosphate and creatine phosphate is better at moving around the cell. Right. So it's like you don't just make a ton of ATP and then pump it around the cell. Creatine is the carrier that takes that high energy phosphate and moves it around the cell for us so that I can then replenish ATP in local in local regions. Like another reason that has to take place is because if you if you don't funnel off the ATP being made at the end of the electron transport chain, you just will shot lay principle yourself and you get a back pressure and the whole chain will slow down. Right. So it's like if I just have a ton of ATP, which is the end of this long reaction chain, you get a back pressure and we're going to try to move things in the other direction. Right. So it's like that ATP has to donate a phosphate to creatine so that I don't have a high ATP concentration. I have an ADP concentration that's going to pull the whole reaction forward. It's like those are the two big reasons there why like that is often overlooked, but it's so important because that creatine phosphate aerobic system, they're totally married. Like I, you can't separate them. They're meant to function off of each other. And, and then you have this weird, this, the weird redheaded stepchild. If anybody listening, this is redheaded. My apologies, but that's just how the saying goes, uh, <laughs> of glycolysis, right? Who doesn't play nice with anybody. It's this more backup. And I think the way you described it, it's a survival system. Yeah. Right. From an evolutionary standpoint, if I'm having to type into glycolysis, something is going terribly wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that we, we also don't appreciate how fast this is actually occurring. You know, when I was like a strength coach looking at this, I was just kind of like, oh, well, I have this like, the, we're talking old model now. You, you have this period of time that's like, depending on what book you read, could be anywhere from five to like 20 seconds, you know? And, and we're like, okay, so five to 20 seconds goes by. And then I shift into this, this other phase. And then there's another phase that lasts for hours. And I'm just kind of like, well, you know, I'm training football players. Our plays are, you know, maybe four to six seconds. So, you know what? I don't even have to worry about these other two things. Um, yeah, what's that last one? That last one out there is just like boring. Who wants yeah. to do that aerobic work? Who wants to do that? But but now what's kind of happening is, is that we've taken that and now it's actually like, oh, wow, this aerobic system, this is actually happening immediately. So as a as even a football strength coach, as any as any kind of coach training, any kind of athlete that almost has to do anything now – the thing that you didn't give a shit about, now you need to care a ton about it because oxygen is your gas. It's and the game. It is yeah. the game. It is the game. Oxygen is your gas and your gas gives you power. So if I'm a strength coach and I'm doing, you know, where we might spend all summer trying to put, you know, 50 pounds on a guy's bench press, if I want him to be able to exp express that, 350 pound bench press that we spent all summer trying to get 
I need to him to express that on the field with repeatability. The only way he's going to be able to repeat it is if he's got oxygen present. No gasoline, no power, which kind of even spills into the next thing is like, okay, well, have you even thought about like who's fueling up the gas tank? And that would be like the respiratory system. And and that's that kind of was the the next kind of when you're talking about like light bulbs. I was like, when when we were first looking at nears, and I was like, okay, well, we're using oxygen right away, and then it shoots back up. But these guys, it's taken forever to shoot back up. It's like two two minutes. I was like, I don't have that kind of time. You know what I mean? Like, dude, yeah. how are we gonna how are we gonna get this to go faster? And then you start realizing, like, oh, you're you're saying that it's the respiratory system that's gonna help replenish this, and. And then that takes you on the rabbit hole of, well, I've never really trained an athlete's respiratory system. You know, how do I, how do I do that? So it, it really just to come full circle. Like if, if you don't understand, you know, even rudimentary uh, bioenergetics, that everything that you're working for from, from a strength and power perspective, uh, depending on your specific event, for the most part, if you're, if you're a team sport strength coach, like, Everything you're working for is pretty much dependent upon this. And let's, let's stop kind of almost let's, let's change, let's, let's change the way we think about it. You know, let, let's, let's stop doing the same old stuff. Let's, let's actually realize that not, not to just d- jump head first into breathing, but like this thing that we thought was like this woo woo, like, Oh, that's, that's for yoga instructors. Like I'm not worried about that. No, this breathing thing, is incredibly important to performance. Like, I think I'm starting to get myself into the camp of the best athletes are the best breathers, you know, and, and our profession really has no respect for breathing. And in my opinion, it's the most under trained functional system in the human body that, I mean, under the heart, like you stop breathing, you don't do too well. So it's, uh, it's definitely something that, that we need to shed some more light on and as a profession as a whole, uh, come to accept it a little bit more. Yeah. You got to be able to move gas around. Yeah. Gas exchange is kind of a big deal, you know, and it's, yeah. So I'll just throw a totally shameless plug here. Like the whole conversation we're having is the reason that I put together that oxygen course mm-hmm. is because it's just, it's something that most people haven't gotten. Like if I think about a huge gaping hole for a lot of strength coaches and trainers, it's like most of them are getting biomechanics and movement talk from someplace. Like they're getting more of that structure and function conversation, how good it is, right? Who knows? But like one place that people just aren't having a conversation in our realm is oxygen, right? This coordination of a respiratory cardiovascular muscular system to get oxygen from the atmosphere to the muscle mitochondria. What does that even look like? How does that happen? What are the regulators? How do I change those pathways? Right? Because like that's that's the progression on because I still think Joel Jameson's book is is great, right? It's a phenomenal place to start. For sure. Phenomenal place. I still recommend that book all the time. But it's like if you want to go to the next step, then you've got to you've got to unpack this cascade. Right. And that was the whole reason I put the course together, because that's my interest. That's what I did in grad school. Um, but the respiratory system that you bring up is really interesting. So I think it'd be worth unpacking that one. Yeah. Like one thing that drives me crazy is like me and Aaron are both kind of MMA fans. And I can't tell you how many times you'll see an MMA coach and they break and their athlete sits down and they're like, all right, big inhales, big inhales, breathe in, recover. And you're just sitting there like, wow. Like even, you have some MMA fighters that are making millions of dollars. You know what I mean? And they have somebody who does not understand the fundamentals of physiology that's doing their, their coaching and, and educating them. Like literally, if we think about it, they just went out, performed high intensity work, built up a ton of CO2, and then they go to their corner and they are literally coaching them not to blow off the CO2, <laughs> not to recover their oxygen source. It's like, what's the worst thing I could do for you in this corner to get you ready and head back into the, this fight? It's, okay, don't blow off the CO2. 
let's just stay there and keep doing giant inhales and not allowing CO2 to basically get blown off so your body can drop more oxygen off to the cell. So you can you might as well just hold your breath. <laughs> let's, just, let's just hold our breath here and then see how you do. And it's, yeah. it's, it's amazing. Like we would watch, uh, I'll go ahead and just call him out. Like you'd watch Conor McGregor fight and you'd be like, man, in the first round, this dude is an absolute freak. Savage. He, yeah. He comes out, comes he, out blazing. And then like by the third round, you're like, who's this guy? You know what I mean? And it's definitely not, I, I don't think it's a training thing. I don't have any, like, I can't give you any definitive, like, oh, data or technology or something like that. But I'm going to go ahead and put all my money in the bank that he probably has a respiratory limitation. You definitely see, like, when we go back to, you know, the the structure, function, bioenergetics thing of it, like, you know, he has structural positions that have respiratory limitations when we look at things like infrasternal angle and then functionally you see him with this extended breathing pattern and then by the way he's getting improperly coached on how to breathe in between like it's just a, and once again when you're talking about a cascade that's a huge cascade but i think i'm definitely in the camp now of if you are an athlete and you want to extend your playing career you need to learn how to breathe so it's almost like we have a car and you're like you know what? A good breather is going to be able to put more miles on their car. A bad breather is going to be able to put less miles on their car. So I want a car that's going to be able to have the most amount of miles that can possibly that you can possibly put on it. So to 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 dissect that, if from a bioenergetic standpoint, I can recover from bouts and refuel my gas tank faster because my respiratory system is now weapon now. And then the reverse of that, I can drop off oxygen to the cell more efficiently and I can repeat power outputs over and over and over again. That's a really good thing for my functional, for the tissue, right? Now I have less stress that goes on the tissue because it, my tissue is spending less time in this survival state. And guess what? If, I'm, if I have oxygen available now from a tissue standpoint, I've got more optimal coordination. Um, I'm going to have less occlusions when you start looking at things like the metabolic reflex and skill acquisition. Like it's hard to have good skill acquisition when my body is shunting blood away from my extremities that I need to perform whatever skill that you want. And it's sending it to my respiratory tissue. And so now from a functional perspective, I've gained a huge advantage uh, from tissue quality and skill acquisition and then structure we look if there's if there's less stress on those tissues, there's less stress on the structure. Meaning, going back to kind of Wolf's law, there's going to be less compensation, and my structure doesn't now have to adapt to a faulty movement pattern or excess stress continually going through the same pattern of tissues. And essentially, now you have a car that you can put more miles on. Right? You've got you've got my Chevy truck. You know. There you go. It'll last forever. <laughs> So when you're, when you're talking about the respiratory system as a limiter, are you thinking more the capacity to move a rib cage to be able to actually get gas flow in and out? Simply because, right, if we think lung tissue structure, it's like an incredibly non-plastic organ in terms of our capacity to say, okay, like I can't hypertrophy a lung like I would hypertrophy a muscle, right? Like I'm not going to grow more alveoli. Yeah. So it's like the lung structure itself, we have a hard time really changing. And, but it's like what we can impact is how well do your ribs move? How well can you move gas in different positions? How much blood is the respiratory musculature stealing from your locomotor muscles? Right. And then the other one that I've mentioned before on here, which right, there's just nothing we can do about is like the red blood cell velocity through the pulmonary circulation. If it gets too high, you don't have loading time, but it's like, well, what am I going to do? Tell you to have a smaller cardiac output. So like we kind of like throw that one out the window, but yeah. we have these other three that we can actually really focus on and have a big impact with. Is that the direction you're coming at with this? I think uh, if we look at like structure, one thing 
in our evaluation that we want to take a look at. And I got to give credit to like the, the PRI crew and definitely Bill Hartman for sure is bringing an appreciation to infrastructural angles and what that means. And so we actually really try to change that. Um, I can't tell you how many times people come to us and they're like, oh, well, I, I was trained to be a belly breather. Um, oh, God. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, no. And, and what I try to explain to people is, is that I want you to be able to not just put, push air into your belly, but we, we all have compressed areas. And so if I look at somebody's posture and say, oh, well, we have compression in their low back, you know, can air expand down there? Probably not too well. So we might want to focus some air down there and create expansion in that compressed area. And so the, the optimal situation is, is that we have this cylinder that can expand 360 degrees. I think everybody's so focused on like, is it my chest? Is it my belly? No, I want 360 degree expansion. Even when I'm coaching somebody on the squat, I put my hands on their rib cage and I'm like, you have this natural weight belt that you can utilize to help protect yourself under load. And so I want to, can you expand there and then keep the air there to protect yourself? So we, we definitely want to try to either, you know, you have two different kinds of infrastructural angles. You have wide and narrow. So we want to push people in the direction that they need to go. Um, and we do use our, our respiratory device to do that, um, which I'll plug. It's the, it's the NX coming to uh, your hands soon. Uh, but so we'll use that to, to basically say, okay, well, where's this person's structure? Where is the compression? And then where can we send air so that we can get that 360 degree expansion? And that's great because that's going to really affect function from the standpoint of, uh, we're going to have more stability. We're, we're going to probably take a diaphragm that is having to do some accessory stabilization that it doesn't really want to do. And say, hey, let's let's focus on uh, respiration, which is your main goal, and then the other functions, for, you know, that dealing with tone and uh, even digestion to go down the, the di diaphragm rabbit hole a little bit. But if we can get that, if we can get that expansion, then that improves our three dimensional movement. Uh, you'll, you'll see multiple times that if we can get expansion in certain areas, that range of motion will increase in, in different joints. And now when we think about respiratory limitation, can we make that person, now that we can expand 360 degrees, that person is a much more efficient breather. You're going to see things like tidal volume increase. If, if I have somebody who's constantly stuck in this extended posture and they're only able to fill, you know, this, this kind of top portion of their chest is what I'm referring to. Think of like any, you know, football player or power lifter. And they're in this drastic extension. Well, if you just go into the structure of the actual lung, you've got more alveoli in the bottom of the lung. Can they even get it down there? You know, maybe they can, maybe they can't. But if you're locked in this extension and from a, from a football coach standpoint, if I have a bunch of guys in extension and they're sitting there and they get tired and their shoulder pads are moving up and down, that takes a lot of energy to do that. And so you touched on it a second ago. You're like, are we, are we sending you know, oxygen and blood flow distribution to these accessory tissues when they should be going to more, uh, you know, they should be going to your limbs because that's what you're using to, to play your sport. So we've got kind of the, the structural side of posture and then we've got the functional side of the respiratory limitation, like, you know, what kind of breathing pattern you have. But then we also get into at, at what respiratory frequency do you find yourself fatiguing at? And then also, what is kind of your, can we increase tidal volume? Can, can you take larger inhales and exhales? So when, when I'm thinking of training somebody from a respiratory standpoint, just like a dumbbell, I'm like, well, can I have them be able to do a higher amount of repetition? So if somebody fatigues at a respiratory rate of 40, if I then make, get them comfortable at 40 and now I can take them to 50, that kind of goes back to that cascade that we were talking about, the car that's going to last longer, right? So now they're going to be more efficient at, you know, delivering that O2 to then be able to desaturate it. Um, so we've got 
the respiratory frequency that we can kind of clear and then kind of like the strength piece. Who doesn't want to get their who doesn't want to touch on the strength piece of the respiratory system, right? So can we get you actually stronger? Can if if before you're blowing out, you know, at maximum like, you know, four liters, and now all of a sudden I have you blowing off five liters. So I've increased your respiratory frequency and I've increased the amount of liters that you can blow off with every exhale. Now I've taken a respiratory system that was an actual limiter for you and I've created it and it's become now a weapon that you can use against your opponent. And that's, that's what we really want. Like I, I would love to have control of a basketball team that during a 30 second timeout is able to use their respiratory system to be able to recover themselves back up to an optimal, we'll say gas tank, right. Versus the opponent. So I would love to be able to tell my head coach, like, hey, guess what? Let that guy call a timeout because every timeout that he takes, that's allowing our team to use our respiratory system to refuel. That means more time in optimal coordination, more time to express maximal power, more time when you're not in a survival state and you're going to probably make better decisions. And that means less turnovers, better three-point shooting percentage, all, all the above, all because we took – and had an appreciation for somebody's respiratory system and said, how can we improve it to make it a weapon instead of a limitation? For sure. Because if we think about whole body exercise, if you're healthy, if you're not old and don't have a disease, you're going to be supply limited during whole body exercise. Like that's just is what it is. There's such an overwhelming amount of data that would support that conclusion. Right. But part of that supply component is whether or not you can load oxygen in the lungs. Because if you don't load oxygen in the lungs well, then you inherently have less supply. By the time it gets to the heart to get pumped, right? Like you just, you're not sending as much out. So a good, I had uh, Evan Pike on on here recently and we were chatting about this with relation to to CrossFit more. Mm -hmm. But like one video that stands out that I remember watching a handful of years ago when we talk about athletes able to breathe and move gas. Mm -hmm. So there's a a video of Rich Froning, like the original CrossFit champ. Do a, it's on YouTube. It's called Frantasy Land. So he does the CrossFit workout Fran, like back to back to back with increasing load and increasing challenge on the pull-ups. And I remember someone sent it to me to check out because it's like, it's incredibly impressive. Like the dude smokes it unbroken with no issues. And I'm like, this is, regardless of your opinions on CrossFit, it's fucking impressive. Um But the biggest thing that stands out to me when I watch that video is homeboy's ability to breathe, like his ability to move gas. It's like under load and then in weird positions. It's like you watch and it's like the breathing is incredibly deliberate. He has clearly put time and attention in to figure out when he wants to breathe. But just watch his like, just watch his rib cage and his thorax. It's like this huge 360 expansion. And then you watch people he competes against who he beats, it's like they don't get that. Like you watch, just watch their thorax and you're getting like, like these really little, like they're struggling to breathe. They're getting tons of neck tone and tension. I'm seeing like all these traps kick on. And it's like, is it really that huge of a surprise that this dude dominated as long as he did? Cause like, he moves gas incredibly well. Yeah. I think it's funny that you're bringing this up. Sorry. I got to charge my, uh, all good. I didn't realize that we'd be burning through all this, this battery life. <laughs> but uh, it's funny that you bring up CrossFit because I'm actually working with a female CrossFitter and she just, she just completed, what is it? 21.2 or whatever. Yeah. They're in the open right now. Yeah, so I haven't seen what the workouts are, but I know it's happening. Yeah. So she had a, she had a workout where it was just like box, it was burpee box jumps and snatches. And so, you know, we had one thing I try to coach a lot of my athletes on is let your breathing dictate your movement. So when you're breathing coordinated, that's when you run into trouble. And so even when we're thinking about like a squat, we want to inhale as we go through the eccentric phase of the squat and we want to exhale as we go through the concentric phase. And we actually put a moxie on her and watch her do the workout in real time. And we've only been working her respiratory system. She's been working with us for like 30 days. So 
we can really get a lot done in 30 days. Right. <laughs> but, uh, but one thing we've, I mean, we've just been hammering a lot of respiratory work with it for the past 30 days. And it was really cool to see she would utilize oxygen when she was doing the burpee box jumps. And then when she was doing the snatches, it was a relatively light weight for her. And so she was able to actually, when her breathing was coordinated and she was inhaling and exhaling properly with the movement, she was recovering all the way back up to optimal performance. And during that time when she's doing the dumbbell snatches, and I was like, when I'm watching it, she did that for the first two sets. And she was like rolling. And I was like, man, she might actually come up with a good time. Like she might kick everybody's ass. And on the third set, she was having trouble coordinating her breathing with the snatches again. And because her breathing became uncoordinated, that started this whole cascade of, well, she was going back up to 80. Think of like a fuel tank. So if you have 80% gas in your tank and you're able to drop it down, well, now she only went to 60. And then on the next set, she only went to 30. And then sure enough, after that next set, she had hit the wall and she was barely, I mean, she finished within the time, but like she definitely didn't come up with the time that she wanted because she was, she was basically in a, in a glycolytic state, right? She wasn't no, she was no longer oxidative. And so you literally watch that car go from being able to go to 300 miles an hour. And from a standpoint of like, we're more efficient, we're getting 36 ATP with oxidation. So now we're only getting a two from glycolysis. And that's basically watching her hit the wall. And it just put more of an onus on, hey, you realize that you broke down as soon as your breathing broke down. And then you can think of it on the flip side. Uh, we can always, just another thought for like coaches that don't have a, a moxie or anything like that. If your athlete's breathing is fully recovered, they're ready to go again. So it, it goes and it goes both ways. Like if, if you have an athlete that's out there and their breathing becomes uncoordinated, they're probably in trouble. If their breathing is fully recovered, they're ready to go again. So even if you don't have like a fancy technology, like a moxie, there's still different things that you can pick up. I mean, amazing coaches like the Dan Pass have, haven't needed, you know, this sports science tech and they just use their eye, but it definitely, definitely makes it a hell of a lot easier. If you have the technology, I, I gotta, I gotta be honest about that. Yeah. It's almost like kind of going into more kinetics or the critical power land, right? It's almost like she hit this point to where she found a metabolic rate that she couldn't reach a steady state with. Mm -hmm. And then once you're not in a steady state and I have this line start climbing, right? Cause it's like, well, if I'm beneath gas exchange threshold, then I reach a steady state. No problem. If I'm beneath critical power, I'll reach a steady state, but we have that slow component that develops I'm still trying to figure out exactly what that is. Mm -hmm. Right. But as soon as I get over critical power and I'm looking at this line, right? Cause if I, if I want to be able to do an activity and maintain that activity for a period of time, like my performance, my power output, I need that to be on a steady state. It needs to be plateaued. If that line like does this and it starts climbing, just start the, start the watch because it's only a matter of time until you are fatigued and you are no longer able to maintain the power output and performance that you're chasing. Like the, you don't even need to really go like read, read critical power literature if you just look at the graphs. Because conceptually, I think it's a really good way to think about like, where is my athlete? Like, are we at a plateau? Is supply and demand able to meet right now? Are we okay? Or am I on the slope? Am I on this line that's climbing? And we're just, it's a matter of time until we have fatigue. I think looking at the breathing and a couple other things is an easy way to just use your eyes and come to that conclusion. Absolutely. Yeah, I think... Uh especially like when, when you start talking about different technology, like, cause we're kind of known for, Oh, we use a lot of technology and stuff like that, but it, it definitely doesn't take away from your eyes and your ability as a coach. I think that's a big misconception. Uh, it just adds to it. It, I can't tell you how many times, like we use the Omega wave teams. I mean, how many times the Omega wave, has started like a very important conversation that I might not be thinking about. 
especially if, if you're a coach and like I did, I saw 10 people yesterday, you know? And so you're seeing 10 people. It's hard to like really like dial in before every session and then think like, okay, well, you know, where was this person last time you saw them? Like, you know, sometimes you're just back to back to back and to be able to look at a screen and then see a complete change in a trend, whether it be like DC potential. Um, I can't tell, especially working with like youth and high school athletes, like you see a kid's DC potential look like a fucking earthquake. And you're like, Hey man, like how are you doing today? How's everything at home? You know, like, it, it definitely can has started some some very important conversations, but at the same time, you can look at him when he come in comes in. You know, if he was up all night fighting with his girlfriend, it's it's probably written all over his face too. But yeah, it's just a. I, I was like I always said the moxie was a great safety net for me, especially when it comes to anybody doing any kind of rehabilitation, because I don't necessarily want to guess every day on volume and intensity and unfortunately the state of physical therapy that we're in like we are still very much in a world of protocol based physical therapy and people will come to us and I'll see these like physical therapy protocols and you could tell like everybody's getting the same thing you know what i mean it's just like the what are those books the like dummy books yeah yeah. Right? It's like not, not to call physical therapists dummies by any means, but it's pretty much like, all right, shoulder pain. Let me flip the page 87. Okay. Here's what you're going to do. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like, That's what it feels like sometimes. Yeah. And people are, people are like, I'm like, Oh, what exercise is doing? They're like, Oh, I'll show you. And they, they pull out all these papers and it's got like three by 10 on like all of them. You know what I mean? Yep. Guaranteed two yeah. to three by 10 yeah. wise T's bent T's. Yeah. Uh, make sure you sleep or stretch too, because you know, you got to get back that internal rotation and sure. why don't you just go ahead and blow out that posterior shoulder while you're at it. <laughs> so it, it very, when I call it like going back to like the safety net is that I get a proxy every day on the tissue and the quality of the tissue and whether we can push that tissue today or whether we need to think about a recovery modality. Um, Cause one thing to think about if you have a tissue that, is not utilizing oxygen, that is a damaged tissue, right? And so if you are performing, if I, if I have two athletes and I have athlete A that I'm going to use the nearest device with, and I have athlete B who I'm not going to use the nearest device with, we can go back, we can use your manual. You know what I mean? You can keep your exercise selection. That's a whole separate topic. But if athlete B does their three sets of 10, right, and can't utilize oxygen, right? Then you know, you just did three sets of 10 of survival that created more metabolic damage. And now athlete B has to recover from that. Athlete A with the nears, I'm like, oh, shoot, this, this tissue is not able to desaturate oxygen. You know what? Today might be a good day to do some recovery protocols, maybe work on other functional systems. Maybe we can work on somebody's left ventricle work. We can work on somebody's breathing. You know, that's what that's what's kind of great about having this kind of respiratory training devices, it always gives you different options and different tools to help somebody when, you know, a lot of people think like, oh, okay, well, you're not going to do anything today. What, are you just going to send them home? Hell no. There's a million things we can work on. So now you come back the next day, athlete B just did three sets of tennis survival and athlete A did a recovery. We come back, same exercise, Athlete B is still in this state of fatigue, still trying to recover, but it doesn't matter. It's Tuesday. You've got three sets of 10. Then athlete B has recovered. The tissue's in a better place. And you, I, you'd be shocked at the amount of volumes when a tissue is in a healthy place that it can handle. Sometimes I'm doing 12, 15 sets of an exercise. And if I'm getting good oxygen utilization, I'm getting the t- kind of contraction by understanding THB. If I'm getting the contraction that I want, and then I'm getting optimal recovery of that oxygen. I might, like I said, I might do 12, 15 sets with somebody. So all that volume in in one day by just having an appreciation for how our tissue actually adapts. I did I did more volume than the three sets of 10 over two days. And that person's, that tissue is still in a state of survival. And I think all too often we are so kind of gung-ho to start work 
especially early on, like any, anytime we get like a new client or you get a new athlete or somebody comes in for rehab, we want to start like doing work. We want to see this person improve. And that's definitely not a bad thing. But I think sometimes we just need to have a little bit more patience and, and understand that we're not running a race to like get you performance. We're actually running a race to get you recovery. Because the faster that you can recover from the stimulus I give you, the faster you adapt. And then the faster and more weight you're going to be able to lift. There's just this, this misconception. I would rather have somebody come in and I get them 1% better every single day. And that looks different, getting somebody 1% better every single day. It doesn't look traditional. Versus before, whether I was, I was kind of just guessing. I was like, okay. We're going to do three sets of 10 today. We're going to do three sets of 10 tomorrow. We're going to do three sets of 10 here. I'm going to deload you for maybe a week. And then we're going to do three sets of, you know, 15 or whatever it is. And you're, you're just kind of up there and you're like, well, I really hope this works. And a lot of times it does, you know, but if I'm working with a multi-million dollar athlete or, you know, the, the dad who wants to be able to play with his son or, you know, go skiing with his family and stuff like that. I'd rather not guess. I'd rather just know and make it, and, and make more informed decisions. So I think uh, we we gotta as a as a profession that deals with people. I feel like improving people for whatever reason it may be. It's in our best interest to try to dive into this information so that we can provide everybody with a better product. Because some of the some of the PT stuff that, that I see people doing, I'm just like, man, are people like looking at this and they're, and they're like, man, this is really good. Like, does this, does this seem like I get this pamphlet, I get these exercises and there's three sets of 10 on, on, on all of them. Like I'm, I'm kind of wondering, you know, sometimes I'll peer into a PT room and I'm just like, man, what are people thinking when they're in there? You know, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's crazy. Without question. I think like all that can be summarized that we need to prioritize quality over anything else. Yeah. I think sometimes we lose track of building as much high quality volume. And like the thing that we talked about at length when Aaron came on was that concept of coordinated contraction, right? And the goal is to build as much volume as possible with these coordinated contractions for our athletes. Like that's at the end of the day, if we want to bottle it down, like that is a very simple goal. The execution of that goal, more complicated, right? But that's, that's what we're chasing. That's what we want to try to have make happen. So Pat, this has been fantastic. I feel like we could easily just keep running on this all day. For sure. I need to come down to Austin and just like bring a camera and a mic and just like sit there and me, you and Eric and just like have coffee and just, just talk about whatever. Um, yeah, but during football season. Yes, dude. Yes. That'd be a good call. Yeah. Cause the Rockets are going to have a football season this year, which will be fantastic. So, uh, we can dissect the game, talk about yeah. how, how we feel about Sarkeesian, whether he's <laughs> the offense like it should be, and and we can point out, oh, look at all these guys with respiratory limitations on the field. Yeah, look at that. Yeah, so it's the end of the second quarter, and they're all dying. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, be fun. for that would be a blast. It was funny. I actually was telling uh, my wife Kels yesterday because we want to come down to Austin at some point because her sister and then our brother, sister and brother-in-law, live there. Um, we were going to try to do maybe in May. I don't think it's going to work out. I was like, you know, we could go in the fall and it'll be football season. <laughs> yeah, and she was like, no interest. No, <laughs> no interest. Has she ever been no. to a game? Have you guys gone down to- at UT? Yeah, down at UT. Has she gone to a game? No, I was like, Kels, it's worth like you should go. Like it'll be a totally different experience than anything that you've done before. Yeah. Like it is a worthwhile life experience to go to a football game at UT. It's a, it, it's a blast. It's a bucket list. It's a bucket list. Yeah. Oh, you gotta, you gotta, do, yeah. you gotta do it. We'll go eat brisket. Yeah. Uh, have some Mexican food, watch football, like be a good, be a good time. What else do you want? Can't, you don't need Minimal. It. There's just, there are very few other things I need. <laughs> oh, dude. Amazing. So, uh, to wrap, can you tell people where to go to find you, what you're doing, everything that's going on at Evolve just so they can jump off the podcast and find you guys if they are so inclined. Yeah, we, we just finished our exercise fizz kind of mentorship. Um, and we'll be having another one soon. 
Uh, we're also going to be putting something out more for sport coaches. So if you're interested in, in understanding just some, some basics of this from the sport coaching side and maybe being able to communicate with your strength coach, that's going to be coming up too. Uh, we do have our respiratory device, the NX. Uh, definitely by the probably the next four four to five months, we'll have that available to uh, to purchase. And we'll be putting out more information there. You can contact me. Uh, Instagram PE Training Solutions is my personal. And then Evolve HP. Uh, Estes at EvolveHP.life is my email. Shoot me an email. We'll, we'll figure out a way to communicate. Beautiful, man. Well, this was fantastic. Thank you again. We'll definitely need to schedule another time to run this back now that we've worked all the all the tech issues yep. out here on round one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. uh, thank you for tuning in everybody you guys have an amazing week uh, we'll be back next week yeah on monday as always all right talk later